Um, today I'm going to present about um, myasthenia gravis uh, and evolving treatment strategy. <clears throat> so I don't have any disclosures today. Um, so what are the objectives of this uh, talk? I'm going to talk about the pathogenesis of the myasthenia gravis, um, how the you know autoantibodies and complements uh, play a role in the you know pathogenesis. What are the tradition, uh, traditional treatment strategies we use these days? You know, both the symptomatic wise and the immunosuppression wise. You know, either immunosuppression or immunomodulation. Um, the the last one is uh, evolving treatment strategies. So, what are the new treatment strategies we are you know working on, like the, through the clinical trials or the animal trials, and, and where are we then now? <clears throat> Um, coming to the uh, myasthenia gravis pathogenesis, so this mainly, you know, we, we believe that it's mainly because of the two uh, uh, mechanisms. One is uh, antigenic modulation, and another one is a functional uh, acetylcholine receptor block. <clears throat> what is antigenic modulation? Right? So antigenic modulation. So here, what happens? Um, this autoantibodies generated against the acetylcholine receptors. They cross links with the receptors. With their cross links, that uh, that cause the accelerated endocytosis and the degradation. So since it is a dynamic process, so you can't compete like you, know, you can't compensate the the degraded acetylcholine receptors. So the net would be there is a loss of acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So that will cause the reduction of the, you know, acetylcholine receptors, and at the same time there is a decrease of transmission. So ultimately, you don't have the no muscle activation. That is one of the mechanism we all know that. <clears throat> the other one is the functional acetylcholine receptor block. So here, the autoantibodies, because they have the, you know, very large molecular size, and they hinder the um, the binding site of the acetylcholine um, and the acetylcholine receptor. And ultimately, you know, they cause the failure of the neuromuscular transmission, and there is no muscle activation. So these are the two, you know, well-known uh, uh, mechanisms of the pathogenesis for the myasthenia gravis. So this is the uh, electron microscope uh, of the you know, two patients. One is a normal person electron micro electron micrograph uh, for the neuromuscular junction, and this is for the myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> So here, um, this is the nerve terminal, um, and this part is a, a muscle membrane, with the postsynaptic muscle membrane. So if you if you see carefully, there is so many peaks and valleys. So these were um, the postsynaptic membrane clefts. Um, so this was like you know all these electron dense materials were um, acetylcholine receptors on this membrane. When you compare this uh, you know, uh, this micrograph with this one. You can easily clearly see the difference. There is there is a whole you know few uh, postsynaptic membrane clefts, uh, and these were not as dense uh, like this image. At the same time, there is some electro dense uh, you know, uh, material uh, within the synapse I mean, between the you know this narrow terminal and the um, and this postsynaptic membrane. Means so from the prior two mechanisms. So neither of those two mechanisms won't cause this effect. We do not know why uh, there is loss of the postsynaptic membrane, right? So the search has begun like in, back in 1970s um, through the animal studies and all the stuff, and, and they found that so the activation of the complement is the one that responsible for this, uh, you know, loss of the postsynaptic membrane of false. So they, they, they found that. Like, like usual, these anti antibodies they bind to the acetylcholine receptors, um, but the FC portion of this IgG antibodies they activate the complement. They once 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 you, once you activate the complement, it leads to the formation of membrane attack complex. This membrane attack complex they destroy, they damage the you know the morphology of the muscle membrane. That's how you lose this uh, postsynaptic cleft and the postsynaptic membranes. That's how we all. You know, in the, in, the, uh, in the medical school, we read as a simplification of the end plate. So there is nothing but it's a kind of the smoothening. There, you lose the all the all the folds. So so ultimately, there is a you know the fewer number of acetylcholine receptors on the 
uh, on the end plate and there is a you know, failure of the transmission and you don't have the uh, muzzle activations. So, so this is one they found, you know, um, uh, research has started like, like I mentioned in the 70s and they found like maybe like last 10 years back or something, maybe 15 years back. So this is just, uh, you know, give you the brief idea about the, you know, complement, how it is activated and what is the terminal pathway. I'm not going into the details, but uh, this part maybe you need to just to um, keep an eye on it. To form the membrane attack complex, um, so you, you mainly need the C5B. So this is the initiator. So the C5B and the C5A, those are the, both the components coming from the C5, the complement factor 5. Uh, we all know the C5A is a chemotaxin. So it is a chemotactive factor. So it, it, uh, it act, attract the you know, pro-inflammatory cells. C5B, so it's an initiator. So along with the C6 and the C7, it forms the membrane attack complex. Uh, this membrane attack complex, like I mentioned before, it plays a major role in the, in the destroying or damaging the muscle membrane. At the same time, we know the MAC is needed for the area clearance and all this stuff. So, what type of evidence we found to say that the complement is the, you know, critical in the pathology of the you know, myasthenia gravis, either in the human or the animal models? When they're doing study, they, they found like a lot of, you know, complement fragments, like the C3 to C19, they, they found all those fragments in the degenerated junctional folds, like in the synaptic membrane. At the same time, you know, the, 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 the sera of the patients, they have like depletion of the complements like C3 and C4. And even in the animal models, uh, that knockout mice for the C5 and the C6, so they, they prevent the, they prevent the um, EAMG. The EAMG is nothing but like experimentally autoimmune myasthenia gravis. So the knockout mice who are deficient with the C5, so they won't develop the myasthenia gravis. So these are all like, you know, um, very good conclusive evidence to say that the complement is the main uh, mechanism. <clears throat> they did the same thing. So they did like a, they administered like human autoantibodies, like the pathological autoantibodies into the mice and they see only mild weakness. The reason being there is no activity, there is no, you know, administration of complement because we just administered only pathological antibodies. We did not administer the complements. So that is the reason why their weakness is only you know, mild that is developed from the antigenic modulation or acetylcholine receptor blockade. So this is a, you know, I got this nice uh, picture from the Solaris website. So the, the, the same thing they are mentioning, like, you know, these are the acetylcholine receptors. It's uh, bound by like the autoantibodies. These autoantibodies again uh, bind with the complements. Um, this complements activation leads to cleavage of C5 into the C5A and the C5B. The C5B um, binds with the other complement factors and the sequence um, the formation of the terminal attack complex, this, this rounds things up. Um, this uh, membrane attack complex, they damage the postsynaptic membrane. You see here is a very good uh, synaptic pulse that has to go through this one. You don't see any postsynaptic membrane here. I mean, this kind of the simplified. <coughs> the other uh, less known mechanisms, um, here I'm going to spend some time. So we know uh, this musk. Um, and the LRP4, uh, this complex, along with this agrin. So this complex helpful helpful for the um, clustering of the acetylcholine receptors. So, so what generally happens, this acetylcholine, um, you know, implanted all over the postsynaptic membrane, but you need them mainly at the motor end plate, so just below the, the narrow terminal. So the, this musk and the LRP4 complex, they drag these, you know, acetylcholine receptors from the different places, to the uh, motor and plate. If any any damage, I mean either, either you know, if the uh, non-functioning of these receptors leads to um, failure of the acetylcholine receptor clustering, that, that means acetylcholine you know, embedded in different places that is not accessible to the acetylcholine. So same way here, like if you have the autoantibodies, they're gonna say either musk or they're gonna say LRP4, um, so they have failure of this acetylcholine receptor functioning and so on. I mean, you don't have the signals passing through that. Um, there, is a, there is a mild difference between these two uh, autoantibodies. Autoantibodies against the musk are belongs to the IgG4 subclass. The tricky part is they do not activate the complement. So like, like I mentioned before, um, acetylcholine autoantibodies, they do 
activate the complements but the IgG4 here they won't activate the complements uh, but it, it can impair the you know aggregated acetylcholine cluster <clears throat> In contrast, LRP4 antibodies like acetylcholine antibodies, they belong to the IgG1 subclass and they activate both the complement at the same time, they interfere with the you know, acetylcholine receptor cluster, this kind of the you know, double effect. <clears throat> so, so those were the uh, main you know, pathogenesis behind the mycin aggravation. So what, what, what was the management? What is the traditional management we do follow? And what are the recent advances? So until October 2017, uh, there were no FDA approved medications for mycin aggravis. <clears throat> all the medications we use were mainly like off-label or you know, clinical research passion or maybe we got something from the transplant world, um, but there were no clear FDA uh, you know, approved medications. So eglizumab, the Solaris is the first newer class medication that got approved in late 2017. So the, the same thing, like I mentioned, there is no FDA approved before that. All other are we use are off label. <clears throat> so when we talk about the mortality, like overall mortality and where we are, back in the days, mycin gravis was a deadly disease. I mean, like in 1920s and 1930s. So with the implementation of uh, negative pressure ventilation and uh, um, and the antibiotics, we made a huge impact in the life expectancy of these mycin gravis patients. There's almost like greater than 50% reduction in the mortality with these interventions. Um, with the, with the, the, in the mid 60s, with the you know um, invention of with the, the interventions of the steroids and the acetylcholine receptors, no, sorry, acetylcholine uh, the injections, there is further uh, improvement, the further drop in the mortality rate uh, um, in the mycin gravis patients. And later in the 1970s, with the you know, advancements in the transplant world, at the same time this with the uh, chronic uh, immunosuppression medications, we did uh, achieve some of the uh, you know, uh, benefits, but not considerable. Um, even still now, until like 2017, so we still have like almost close to 10% of the mortality rate in, in the overall, you know, um, when you compare with the overall uh, patients. So there is still a lot of you know, work to do, like to um, to bring this 10% mortality to you know, maybe 3% or 2% or something like that. So that means we need a newer management. So I mean, you know, that's the point. So this these were the uh, commonly used therapies for the myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> so we all know the symptomatic treatment, like the you know, uh, This is one way of increasing the acetylcholine in the synaptic um, the synapse, and that's how you will temporarily, like at least like for the time being, you have the um, um, symptom control, but it won't really uh, have any role in the uh, halting the disease process. <clears throat> And the prednisone we use, um, so there were there was a randomized control trial um, for the superiority of the prednisone over the placebo. Um, they did back in 1960s, um, maybe 1970s, I guess, on the ocular uh, myosin gravis patients. But later we we used the prednisone for you know all types of myosin gravis, either in the generalized or ocular. And we see a good improvement in those days. Though. Um, and acetylopurine and the mycophenolate, and those are the two, you know, most commonly used immunosuppressive medications these days. Uh, like I mentioned, the clinical efficacy of these two medications are mainly retrospective studies. There is no head-to-head, -head or maybe there is no direct uh, randomized controlled trials on on, on the mycin gravis patients. <clears throat> Um, in the 1980s or something, so we, we have this uh, immunomodulation therapies, and the plasma pheresis, plasma and IVIG. These are very quick. I mean, so within like one to two, one to seven days, you get the you know good benefits. Um, they have like substantial. They mainly used in the acute uh, management, like you know mycin gravis crisis, in the acute settings. The other one we use are the thymectomy. Uh, so thymectomy, I mean, we have the mixed results. Some, some people do develop, some some people do improve, and some people do not. Uh, and most of the people, even after the thymectomy, um, they require the immunosuppression. So I'm not gonna go into the details of the thymectomy. <clears throat> so uh, this is a nice uh, um, the graph representing how the you know um, mycin gravis has changed over the years. So there are the, there are a couple of graphs. The the, the first you may need to uh, just concentrate on this teal color bar. So when you look at this uh, bar, so you see there is a clear 
uh, improvement on this bar, right? So that, that represents the mortality, the death. You know? The people die from the Mycenae graves has decreased subsequently, you know, all these years from the 1940 to maybe in the 2000, the last 60 years. That's a good improvement. At the same time, when you look at this orange bar, and again, you see there is a good improvement. So the, the, the people who symptoms improved from these current managements, that is also a good name. So we fixed a couple of the things. The, the, the most concerning thing was this green bar. So when you look at the green bar, even in the 1940s, it's, it's 10%. Even like in the 2000s, it's 10%. So the green bar represents the remission. So the, the people go into the remission is unchanged. It's kind of the same, like in all these 60 years with all these advancements in the managements, but still you have you know, quite a number of patients they are still you know unable to go into the remission they, they, sorry going to the remission but it's only 10 percent people and some of the people they they don't have any symptoms change like the unchanged symptom they stay the same like you know 20 percent of the patients mm, wherever they start with the mycena gravis and they end up like this there is no improvement or there is no worsening we, we fix a couple of the things but there are there's so much work to do i mean in terms of the remission and the people with the same you know symptoms throughout their life <clears throat> and how do you how do you quantify and how do you say that you know the patient sim patient symptoms improved or not based on what what are the scales do you use to measure the outcomes so these are the uh, kind of the most commonly used scales especially you you know come along with them especially when you read these uh, and the clinical trials they use all the time so the first one is the myasthenia gravis adl the adl means the activities of daily living so this is the most commonly used one, I guess. <clears throat> it has the eight questions, the eight items, and each item, with each question has three responses. And the total is like 24. <clears throat> so six being the worst, uh, six, six being the you know, worst score is the 24, and the six being the kind of the median score. So anything more than six score, you consider as a moderate disease severity. Okay. The, um, the other one, uh, at the same time, so these days, you know, um, these instance companies look for these ADL scores uh, in your note. I mean, especially when you see the patients in the clinics, um, they, they, they look at this based on ADL score. So if they want to approve the you know, medication or not, they, they go from these details and they, they take, they consider it. So it, it would be good if you mention these ADLs in your, in your note of the clinics. <clears throat> this, the second thing is the quality of life index. Um, like I mentioned, it's a 15. It's a 15 questionnaire. And the, each question has the four responses. There's a total of 60. And the median is like 20, 22 or something. So anything greater than 22, again, is come under the moderate disease burden. The other ones are uh, manual muscle testing. It has like 30 items and the total score of being 60. Uh, we won't use much, but uh, it's also one of the scale. And the QMG, the quantitative myasthenia gravis. This is also we use a lot. Uh, it's a multi-domain assessment. It has 13 items, and each item has three responses. The worst could be 39. The other one is just the you know mix of everything is MG comp composite. Uh, not using much. <clears throat> so these are the you know some of the frequently used scales to to measure the outcome. So uh, this is uh, um, so this information we we got from the you know. Um, it's kind of from the Japanese and the European and the North American in the registries. They, they bring everything, all the information into the into one picture, um, and they, they they put all this information into into a graphical manner. Um, here you can see the MG ADL score, like I mentioned before, it has eight questionnaires, and the the worst score being the 24. Um, anything above the six, <clears throat> so ADL greater than the six, you you consider as a moderate disease burden. So when you look at this graph, almost like more than 50% of the patients are come under um, at least like moderate disease burden, more than 50%. You look at this graph, and this one is the QIL, the quality of life index, or the quality of life score. Um, here it has, you know, 30 items, <clears throat> sorry, 15 items, and it has the uh, worst score of like, like 60. The mean score is like 22. So, so anything greater than 22, it, again, you consider as a moderate uh, disease burden. So it's, it's almost like more than 50%, maybe 60% of the people uh, are come under this category. So, so all this all this information, like, you know, the, the one I mentioned before here and uh, and here, they clearly say that, so whatever the improvements we have over the years, but still there are substantially, at least like more than 50% of the patients has moderate disease burden. So that's very unfortunate. We, we have a lot of work to do then, right? <clears throat> 
so that's why there are so, you know so many you know clinical trials going on now to find the new ways to better understand the pathology so where we are you know lacking where we are uh, failed so so that's how they, they bring some of these uh, new class of drugs you know they, they were mainly biological uh, some of have entered the clinical experimentation some are at the drug agencies and some are at the you know phase one trials so we 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 just broadly classify them into the three major groups uh, one is the complement inhibitors uh, we have we know now what would be the you know, main pathology of the myasthenic gravis <clears throat> the second was the neonatal fc receptor antagonist um, and third one is the anti b cell therapies um, so these were the three major groups uh, of those medications currently going through the uh, clinical trials <clears throat> this is a, a uh, it's a busy slide. I, I'm going to spend some time here to, to just to understand the, what is the mechanism of those medications and how do they help us. Um, to, to make it simple, like, you know, the, the T cells mature in the thymus. Those T cells interact with the B cells and leads to the activation of those B cells, you know, maturation of these B cells or whatever. So they become like the plasma cells, right? So these plasma cells produce the autoantibodies. Those autoantibodies uh, activate the complements. Once you activate the complement, it leads to the formation of the membrane attack complex and it destroys the immersion morphology. So in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this cycle, if you halt any of those processes, so you can achieve your results, right? <clears throat> so we, we can start from the bottom, right? So how to, how to stop the complements, how to you know, inhibit the complement system. So there are, there are the points like in the C5, like I mentioned before, the C5 is the main thing so it divides into the c5a so the breakdown into the c5a and the c5b the c5b is the component that initiate the uh, membrane attack complex formation so if you block the c5b you can achieve that right so there's one other medication they are trying the xylucoplan so there's a c5b inhibitor another one is the c5 inhibitors those were eclizumab and ravulizumab those are the two other medications they inhibit the c5 and they prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex so this is the one type of uh, one group of medications. The second group of medications were F, uh, FC receptor antagonists. So these receptors, this FC receptor, um, this will help you uh, to recycle the auto -anti like antibodies, like in, in general sense, like all the antibodies produced in the body, they, they should be kept uh, protected from the lysosomes, from the degradation, and they, release, they should be released into the system whenever you need them. So FC receptors are the one, they helpful for the recycling of these uh, antibodies. It doesn't matter, these autoantibodies are like regular infectious antibodies. So if you block these uh, FC receptors, so there is no protection for these antibodies from the you know, lysosomal degradation. So overall, there would be a fall in the reduction in the uh, antibodies. So that is also one way of you know, achieving your, your goal. The third one is uh, <clears throat> inhibiting the B cells, like, uh, prevents the uh, production of the uh, immunoglobulins, either by, you know, uh, blocking the plasma cells through the proteasome inhibitors like the bortezomib, or directly you inhibit the B cells, like, you know, CD20 inhibitors like the Tuximab. Or maybe you can block at the interaction between the T cells and the B cells, or you prevent the activation of the B cell, you know, cytokines, like the BAFF. Those other ways, these were all under the, you know, uh, phase one or the phase two uh, trials. So um, um, this is the uh, same um, um, class of drugs I just talked about. I'll quickly go through this one. Like I mentioned, these first three drugs were uh, complement inhibitors. Uh, Eclizumab, we all know, it's FDA approved in 2017. The other medications were still under trial. They are at the phase three trial. They're going to be in the market in coming days. These four drugs were the second class of drugs. Those were FC and receptors. Like I mentioned, they help for the recycling of the auto uh, like, uh, antibodies. Doesn't matter auto or regular antibodies, but recycling of these antibodies, especially IgG subclass. <clears throat> the other medications we know, the class three, the rituximab um, and other other drugs. Those were either directly or the indirectly they they block the B cells, so there would be um, less production of the IgG uh, overall. The other cells are like, you know, uh, stem cell uh, transplantations are the gene therapy they are, they are working on, uh, but they are still at the phase one or the phase two trials. <clears throat> this is kind of the same picture that 
I discussed, but maybe you can concentrate on this right side of this diagram. Like I mentioned before, on this red color were the um, antibodies. Those antibodies were bind with the FC receptors, this green color. Once they, they, once they, they go into the, in the cell, um, they are protected from the lysosomal degradation and released whenever you need it. So in case if you block the FCRN receptors, um, these antibodies will be degraded by the you know, lysosomal enzymes. So that is the mechanism action of FCRN receptors. The other things are your kind of clear, you know, complement inhibitors and B-cell inhibitions and everything. <clears throat> so let's talk about the complement inhibitors. Like I mentioned, we have like three drugs uh, in the complement inhibitors. The one uh, FDA approved was the eclusimab. So in the 2017, uh, so I got this paper from Lancet Neurology. So it shows the like the safety and the efficacy of the eclusimab uh, in the refractory myasthenic gravis patients and who are positive for acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So it's a phase three randomized control, uh, control study. Um, like I mentioned, the eclusimab is a you know monoclonal antibody (MAB) monoclonal antibody. Um, it's a um, it prevents the you know breakdown of C5 into the C5A and the C5B. And we know C5A is a chemotactic and the C5B uh, it initiates the membrane attack complex formation. <coughs> um, so this is the summary of this study. So regain study uh, for the eclusimab. So they, they selected some of the you know uh, close to like 140 patients, are, um, and all of those patients got the meningococcal vaccines. And you may wonder why the especially the meningococcal vaccine. So what will happen when you um, block the complement? So there is there is no formation of the membrane attack complex. So membrane attack complex is the one that helpful to clear the Neisseria meningitis. So to block it, so you are more risk of having those meningitis from the Neisseria. So that's why you. People, people, all the participants got the meningococcal vaccinations um, before the study. <clears throat> so they enrolled this patient, they randomized into the two uh, arms. One is a treatment arm, one is the eclusimab, uh, another one is a placebo arm. And the study period is for the 26 weeks. And they extended for like you know, up to 52 weeks to see how the benefits are going. <clears throat> but, the, but the design study was for the 26 weeks. Some of the inclusion criteria, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it's for the refractory myasthenic gravis patients. So refractory means like they either fail with the two immunosuppressive medications or uh, one immunosuppressive medication and requiring the chronic immunomodulations like the PLEX or the IVIG. At the same time, ADL score greater than six, that means the moderate disease burden. Uh, and all the patients should be positive for ACH receptor antibodies. Um, another one is the myasthenic gravis foundation of America classification. It has the class two and the class four. Uh, they all come under uh, moderate disease burden. So they, so they, they found, you know, they put this inclusion criteria. <clears throat> what are those endpoints? Um, like I mentioned before, so most of the times they use this um, uh, outcome measure scales. They see how much is the change from the baseline um, in terms of the activity and the functionality. So MGADL score, how much is change at the at the, at the 26 weeks? At the same time, how much change at the QMGs, uh, uh, the quality of life. Um, the three point reduction or the five point reduction. So these are how, some of the endpoints um, they try to achieve. <clears throat> so what did they do? This were uh, the graphical representation of this two uh, treatment arms. Like uh, sorry, the two arms. One is the is the red color is the placebo arm, uh, and this blue color is the treatment arm. So in those two, like uh, in all the scales, like ADL and the QMG or the quality of life and MGC, uh, you see there is a clear benefit with the, with the eclusimab treated patients. They achieve you know good benefits compared to the placebo group from here and here, uh, here and here. In in all the aspects, you know, even the primary and the secondary endpoints, they they achieve their good results with the uh, eclusimab treated patients. So. The regain study demonstrated that the eclusimab treated patients have at least like 16 point to change from the baseline compared to the seven points in the placebo group, almost like more than double um, at, at week 26. <clears throat> in all the scales, you know, ADL, QOL, in the QMG, like I mentioned before, uh, they see the improvement. At the same time, the improvement was sustained to the week 52, like, you know, the extended trial on the 26 weeks and see how they, you know, how it, uh, it going. So it's uh, the, the the improvement almost like up to up to 52 weeks 
the thing is from the subgroup analysis they, they found that how the you know um, um, hospitalization rate and the exasperation rates were changed you clearly see this one is the eclizumab treated group and this one is a placebo treated group and this is the baseline but it's like 74 reduction in the exasperation rates with the eclizumab and at least 65 when you compare with the placebo so there is a there's a big improvement right 65 percent the same time with the hospitalization rates there is more than like 71 percent reduction in the hospitalization rates when you compare with the placebo or when you compare with the baseline there is 83 percent reduction so um that's always good news right so the subgroup analysis and showed that there's a you know um, IVIG demonstrated rapid and robust improvements in their myosinogen graves outcomes and the fewer disease exacerbations with eclizumab. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, there's a 65% reduction in the, in the exacerbation rates when you compare with the placebo arm. So, um, in, the, in, the, in the same class, uh, the complement inhibitors, the another medications they are they are working on the xylucoplan. So xylucoplan is a more specificity. It's bind specific to the C5B. Uh, it gave the very positive results in the phase two study. Uh, now it's ongoing phase three trial. <clears throat> I have a few slides about the phase two study. Um, so they so so they mainly use the, the two uh, um, doses of xylucoplan, like the 0.1 mg per kg and the 0.3 mg per kg. And this uh, you know kind of the blue line is for the placebo. So they look for the you know, levels of this uh, xylucoplan in the plasma, and they compare how much is the complement inhibition. You see the red levels, like I mentioned, this is the high dose of xylucoplan, like the 0.3 mg per kg. Uh, with these uh, levels in the plasma, this complement is almost like close to 100% inhibitor, almost close to 100%. And with the 0.1 mg per kg, it's almost like 90% or something. So there's no big change, even though there's a change in the dose, but uh, it's close to 90, 90 to 95%. With the placebo group, they have the high complement system. So, so they, they they just want to prove that the xylucoplan, you know, is a very good at inhibiting the complement system. And again, they use the some of the scales like the QMG scale and the ADL scale, and see the same. The xylucoplan is the this this red line, and this uh, blue one is for the placebo, and you clearly see the improvement at the at the at the end of the 12 weeks. Um, so. <clears throat> The other medication is the rabelizumab. So this is the third medication from the you know, complement inhibition. inhibition. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of the eclizumab, you know, like the C5 blocker, but it's a, a more of like subcutaneous injections. So you can give like daily kind of. It's, it's going through the in the phase three trial. <clears throat> Second class of drugs, uh, FC receptor inhibitors. Um, there are there are many types of uh, you know FC receptor inhibitors, but uh, the the one we 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 uh, use are the neonatal FC receptors. They are the one they play major role uh, in the IgG homeostasis. Like the G is a subclass important, not like all the IgG isotypes. It's only in the IgG homeostasis. <clears throat> Um, I think I, I told you before how they work. I mean, they, they, their main role is protecting the IgG from the lysosomal degradation. So they block the FCR receptors. So that's why recycling of the IgG reduced. Uh, overall, there is a you know uh, rapid fall of the, all the IgG subclass. I mean, if you get the good uh, results or the effects at the end of the trial, because most of them are like the phase three trial. So you can almost alternatively that you can use instead of the plasma paresis and uh, and uh, IVIGs because. Now, with this one, you can see like 70% fall within the first week. Um, so you can at least like overcome the need for human plasma for these IVIGs. At the same time, the patients have the poor vascular access or something. If you don't use the plexa, you can't use the plexa. Um, so you can use these new medications in the future uh, in acute settings. <clears throat> the, the one interesting thing with this uh, receptors, it, it it is kind of effects on the IgG antibodies. So it doesn't matter if the patient has musk antibodies or the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. The, the prior class uh, complement inhibitors, they mainly work on the acetylcholine receptors. They won't work on the musk positive patients because the musk won't activate the complement, that's why it won't work there. But these the FC receptor inhibitors, um, they have nothing to do with the complements. So their main role is to um, rapid fall in the IgG subclass. So they work both in the acetylcholine receptor and the mask and even the LRP4 antibodies. So it's a, it's a good one. So one of the medication from this uh, class, FC receptor blockade is the F, Fgartizumab. And so th this is a mutated IgG1 FC portion. 
like i mentioned there is a 70% reduction in the all igg subclass within the first week um, so that's why we use alternatively for and plasma pheresis surplex in the coming days <clears throat> and it's on the phase 3 trial the adapt uh, they haven't uh, submitted yet but uh, they found that there is a clinically meaningful improvements in the functionality and the strength uh, following the treatments <clears throat> The other uh, couple of the medications from the same class, the Rosano um, this is also the monoclonal antibody. So it shows the promising results in the phase two study and the phase three trial is going on now. Um, the other one is the uh, Nipocalimab, it's still at the phase two trial. <clears throat> These are the, some of the medications for the um, FC receptors. Uh, coming to the direct B cell receptors, I mean, so B cell receptors, it has the two. Uh, one is the direct B cell receptors, another one is the uh, indirect, indirect B cell uh, depleters. <clears throat> um, so in the retest maps, we, like I mentioned, we don't, we don't have the you know direct randomized control trials, but we have these uh, um, um, retrospective studies. So from the systematic review of these uh, you know, retest map usage in the MG, they found that. You know, Almost like 44 patients of the, 44 percent of the patients, uh, they showed like minimal uh, uh, symptom manifestations. Uh, are at least like 27 percent of the patients they have uh, complete uh, remission um, from the from, from the usage of the rituximab in the myasthenia gravis. <clears throat> and the interesting thing is, uh, musk patients uh, are are better uh, compared to the Acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients. Almost like 72% of the patients um, achieve the, you know, either remission or you know, minimal manifestation of symptoms uh, compared to um, 30 patients in the, you know, acetylcholine receptor positive patients. Um, so that's why the retexamide works better for the mass positive um, antibodies. <clears throat> um, there's a limitation for the rituximab. So the, the, the problem is, so the CD20, is a, rituximab is a CD20 inhibitor. So the CD20 is not expressed on the plasma cells, on the plasma blasts. So, um, so, so that is the reason why. So it's, it's not like long acting, right? You know, because uh, it's just inhibit the B cell, uh, uh, mature B cells or something, or the immature B cells, but it's not, have no effect on the plasma cells of the plasma blast. So um, another one is the indirect B cell depleters. Um, like how, um, like I mentioned before in, in, in the diagram, so they are the proteasome inhibitors. Um, this is called the botizomib. Um, it's mainly uh, targets the plasma cells uh, through the proteasomal uh, inhibition. Um, it also effective in the uh, animal models, um, but it's still at the um, uh, phase one and the phase two trial. Some of these trials were kind of terminated because of, uh, you know, um, I think uh, ethical issues or something. Um, the other one is the belimumab. Um, it's a um, autoantibody against the BAFF. It is one of the um, activating cytokine for the B cells. Um, so they they did the phase two studies and they did not find much benefit um, compared to the standard of care. So um, they haven't started the phase three trial yet. So they they stuck at the phase two study only. The another one is the tocilizumab. We use the tocilizumab for all of the, um, some, some other autoimmune diseases. Uh, the same hope they are trying on the um, Mycena gravis. <clears throat> so mainly the uh, interleukin-6 receptor, um, it works against the interleukin-6 receptors. Um, and the people with, the, uh, with this treatment and this showed some of the improved signs uh, of the you know, experimental Mycena gravis. So it's still at the phase two trial. <clears throat> So what is the outline? Um, so like I mentioned, so despite the clear uh, clear cut improvements in the overall clinical state, like you know those achieving the um, you know death mortality rate or the imp symptom improvement, uh, there is a clear improvement, but there is no change uh, in the in the in the people who went into the uh, remission state. So so for the for those main those two reasons, so we need to better understand the pathology and see what are the newer therapeutic options we have. Um, the complement cascade plays a very crucial role in the pathogenesis of myasthenia gravis that we um, got from the animal studies and the human studies. Um, we know the black up complement system will help to halt the ongoing pathological process. And we found that one of the FDA-approved drug. 
so in the in the future um, so newer medications like the eglutumab or the xylocoplan those are for the inhib complement inhibitors at the same time fcrn receptor fgartizumab so this will be the future of the mg management in the, in the coming days <clears throat> thank you Thank you, Dr. Boga. It's a, a very good review. Uh, so the, um, I have a, a couple of comments. Uh, the, I think the most interesting thing is it's like a, a methanol gravis out the lifetime outcome. You you mentioned the four groups. One is a remission, another is unchanged, the third one is improve it, and the mm -hmm. fourth one death. Seems to me, you know, that over the 50 years, uh, what do we have, what do we have done? The remission group with the same. Yeah. Also, unchanged group is the same, and also improved group is better. It's much better, and the death rate decrease. I think that's what we are doing. So, <laughs> the remission group, I, I don't know what's the criteria. That's just patient. Uh, the patient does not have uh, any symptoms or still on medication, there will be kind of remission or you have to, patient has to be off the medications. Um, so, so to, to my knowledge, the remission is they do uh, depend on medications, but they don't have almost like uh, non symptoms. The MG, oh, okay. the GADL score at least greater than, uh, sorry, less than the six. So, okay. But in, in, in you know, I think it's my patients, uh, the group looks like, uh, you know, remission, like probably more than 10%. We have, uh, I have uh, many patients actually do not have uh, symptoms, but uh, they're still taking medications. Uh, I think it, so if that's true, the remission group has never changed. And I, I'm thinking about, you know, a lot, a lot of experts say, you know, like special some treatment like uh, thymectomy, potentially there's an increase uh, the rate of a remission looks like this statement probably is not true because the remission 10% never changed in the over 50 years. Even a lot of patients get a thymectomy. So yeah. that's the one. Another is more interesting, uh, the group is unchanged. About 20% of patients, what they will do, the patient the same. So I think about this group, maybe, you know, they have a different mechanism. That's made me think of what are we, the all treatment now is mainly a focus on B cells or antibodies and the complement. And there are some like it probably affected T cells on a little bit. But this also, you know, mainly like a um, immune therapy. I'm thinking about that twenty percent of patients may have a different mechanism because that's you if we do Im immune therapy right now, we all therapy is about you know immune therapy. I can man, cannot make any changes. So patient might have like a, they might have a different underlying mechanism. That's something I'm thinking about. So of course the you know the the improved group is better and the death rate decrease. I think we should take the credit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Okay. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank you for that nice Thank review you. of uh, the, uh, the the newest and uh, the, the hopefully things that are going to be available in the near future. I, I I can tell you for sure that the FCAR mod, whatever the brand name of that is going to be, uh, that's that's going to be coming out within the next year, I'm sure. Um, but uh, so a couple questions or uh, comments. For th thymectomy, you said uh, most people after thymectomy they need ongoing immunosuppression, and uh, I think as neurologists we are biased because uh, it's it's a sampling error. If a patient doesn't need immunosuppression, if they are in remission, true remission, drug-free remission, uh, they're not going to come to you, and so everyone you see who's had a thymectomy, still needs immunosuppression, they're still having symptoms, and, and the people who are the success stories are not showing up. So just keep that in mind. If you, if you, uh, if you are uh, skeptical 
of the uh, of the efficacy of thymectomy, keep in mind that you are see seeing the failures and the successes are out there. Um, so that's just something important. Yeah. And then the only other, and that's that's what I would consider remission, like drug-free remission. Uh, the only other drug-free remission that I have seen with uh, myasthenia is if you have a patient with musk and uh, you, you, you are able to get them onto rituximab, you will actually see some people who are in drug-free remission for years. For some reason, musk is exquisitely sensitive to rituximab. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, the uh, severity scales are uh, there. Yeah, like you mentioned, there are a few of them. Uh, if you, if anyone here is uh, interested in going into uh, clinical trials, uh, drug trials, um, you should figure out what severity scales are used in your area and start recording those things on your patients because uh, if a company is is trying to find sites to do a clinical trial they're going to send you a survey and they're going to say how many patients do you have with this severity who have this uh, level of you know this level of treatment and if you have a database immediately available with these severity scales for whatever disease you're 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 interested in uh, you will be able to, uh, you will have those numbers at hand. Uh, you can reply faster and you can give them accurate numbers. You're not just guessing. You don't want to get enrolled in a clinical trial and, and not enroll any patients. Uh, that looks bad. And then uh, if you underestimate, then they're, they're not going to choose you as a, as a study site. So, uh, so find out what severity scales are used in whatever disease you are interested in and start using them uh, now that we have something. Uh, EPIC actually has some functionality uh, uh, that all scripts did not. You can, you can search through EPIC. Uh, there's a feature that uh, you, can, you can search your patient database and come up with numbers like this. Um, and then uh, the uh, those FC receptors are actually, I think those are the most interesting. That FGAR tigamod is coming out is 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 focused or targeting the FC receptors. And uh, and the FC receptors are um, so they're on the cell membrane. Um, all of the antibodies that are floating around in in the extracellular space are are. They're just randomly endocytosed, or it's pinocytosis. It's just the, the cell is taking a sip of, of extracellular fluid, and, uh, and inside of that little uh, extracellular fluid, there are some antibodies floating around. And on the wall of that vesicle are these FC receptors. And if the antibodies attach to those FC receptors, um, they will get sent up back up to the surface and released, and that, that antibody will survive for a little bit longer. It will have a longer half-life because it gets recycled. But if all those FC receptors are occupied, everything that is not attached to the wall is going to go down into the lysosome and it's going to get digested. And so these FC receptor uh, antibodies or uh, FC receptor agonists, um, they are, they're blocking it's kind of like they're filling up the recycle bin so that everything inside the vesicle spills over into the garbage can. So if the recycle bin is full, uh, the all, everything inside of the vesicle gets, gets uh, thrown away. And that is actually one theory on how IVIG is helpful. Because if you dump a whole bunch of antibodies into this, into this vesicle, all those FC receptor sites are going to be saturated, and more of the antibodies are going to go down garbage chute. They can't be recycled anymore. So, and obviously, uh, plasma exchange is another way to get rid of antibodies. But these FC receptors, uh, you're basically speeding up the metabolism of the antibodies. So, that that was the only thing I 
bad, but that, that was a great, great review of, the, of some exciting new options for our uh, myasthenia patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. A great job, Boka. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Boka. That was Thank really good. Thank you, Dr. Palade. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day.